Test, test, test. Oh, yeah. We're back again. Some of you are probably thinking, man, I've seen and heard from Mr. Scott. Feels like we're back in school. And you'd be correct. If you thought we're going to have some snow days or some ice days and you were not going to hear from me, you were sadly mistaken. So this time I'm back with another video getting you prepared for your Unit 7 test. Now, hopefully by now you have seen uh, my review video, you've looked at the review, you've played a couple of Book It games, adjust my camera, but, all right. uh, you've played a couple of Book It games, uh, maybe you still don't have an understanding, and that's what this video is for. Many of you have expressed you understand the material, right? But for some reason, when it comes to doing it on a, on a test, you get nervous. So I created the slideshow with about five or six different questions that are higher level of making you apply what you know. So without any ado, let's get started. So the first question <clears throat> says, albinism is a autosomal recessive condition. It wants us to figure out which circle graph shows the genotype probability when an albi albino female mates with a male that is heterozygous for the albinism trait. Um, one thing we've always talked about, making sure that we identify what the question is asking us and all the information in the question. So a couple things that stand out to me. We know, I'm going to underline this, that it is a recessive condition, right? So if the female is alb albino, her genotype, move my coffee, her genotype is going to be little a, little a. <clears throat> and we know that the male is heterozygous for albinism trait, which means heterozygous. Anybody got the answer? Different. That's right. Different size letters. So he is going to be big A, little a. Now, if this were me on a test, this is exactly how I would work it. I would look at what do I already know? What in the question? What are some things I know in the question? I know what recessive means. I know what heterozygous means. So I know this is their genotype. Now, I'm going to create a Punnett square. And I'm going to put little a, little a, big a, little a. Now I'm going to do my cross here. Big A, little A, little A, little A. <clears throat> now that I've done that work, now, based off of the stuff that I've done, now I can look at the answer choices. Is there any answer choice that matches my Punnett square? And the correct answer would be F, because I have half, that is, they have a 50% chance of having a child that is albino and then they have a 50 percent chance of having a child that is not albino very very straightforward testing your knowledge on if you know what recessive means heterozygous if you know what those things means and you know what the genotype is you'll be fine on this type of question everybody got that if not rewind this and watch it again all right, number two. Let's go on to our next one. Well, if this will work, let's see. Oh, too far. Wrong way. Oh, there we go. All right. <clears throat> this next question, it says, which diagram demonstrates how crossing over contributes to genetic variety during meiosis so again you're given four different pictures not a whole lot to go off of um, hopefully by now we've seen a lot of different pictures of crossing over um, again this is just very straightforward if you know what crossing over is if you remember um, you studied the pictures we've looked at for crossing over you already saw this answer right off the top of your head you already knew that the correct answer would be c Again, 
<clears throat> this is where here, this is where the tetrit forms. We know we see two homolog homologous chromosomes pairing up with each other. They form a tetrit, and the reason why they're pairing up is so that they can share information. So they share information, they cross over, and now we get that genetic variation that we're looking for out of this. So A is not a correct answer because even if I didn't know what crossing over was, we could go process of elimination. I know A is not correct because A is a Punnett square. So that has nothing to do with crossing over. I know B is, she looks like chromosomes lining up in the middle. When we say that phase that was, everybody said it, metaphase, good. That is metaphase. So I know that has nothing to do with crossing over. Can be confusing. Some I can see how somebody would choose that, but as much as we've looked at these phases, we know that is metaphase. And then D is our good friend, DNA replication. So I'll mark that out. Process of elimination leaves me with C. Let's clear that off. Go back. Our next question. So, <clears throat> a mutation in which types of cells would only affect the organism and not the future generations. Now, here's where they can throw in, we can throw in a bunch of different words to kind of throw you off. So, let's go make this easy. So, the organism, or we could put parent and Future generations, when we talk about future generations, we're talking about kids, we're talking about offspring, right? So I'm going to put kids or offspring. So before we look at any answer choices, let's look at the type of cells that we know. So first off, we're looking at a mutation. What are the two types of cells? that we have in our body. We have somatic cells, which are essentially body cells, and we have gametes, which are those sex cells, sperm, eggs, right? So now I know from prior knowledge, somatic cells are body cells, gametes or sex cells my two sex cells sperm and egg so what i can do is again i'm showing you how i if i was taking this test how i would process it i'm going to go through first and mark out any answer that has sperm and egg because i know that a mutation <clears throat> a mutation in body cells would not affect the offspring. So if it has anything to do with body cells being affected, I know body cells, that is my correct answer, right? So here we go. So the question is, which type of cells would only affect the parent and not the future organisms? So <clears throat> we know sperm if it's a mutation in the sperm cell, it could potentially be passed down to the offspring. Our question is asking, it's not going to affect future generations. So I'm going to mark that out. Again, egg and liver cell. That's not correct because egg is a, is a sex cell. And we know if a mutation is a sex cell, it could potentially impact future generations. So I'll mark that out. This very clearly says... Sperm and egg cell gives me both sex cells. I know that's not right. Which my process of elimination leaves me with H. It would be nerve and brain cells. So if you have a mutation, if you have something that happens in the skin cells, uh, brain cell, nerve cell is a skin cell. Those are skin cells. It will not be passed down to the offspring. So your correct answer is H. Sorry that got a little long. It's early in the morning. I still haven't finished my coffee, but we still get to still get to the right answer. Check the mug, the Batman mug. Yeah. All right. So 
that is how we would approach that type of question. All right, let's go back. <clears throat> so, again, here's that word again. Gametes, gametes, gametes. Sex cells, right? Gametes produced by an organism contain a combination of genes from that organism. In every gamete, the combination is blank. We've got four answer choices. A says it's the same because it is created from the same DNA. Hmm, that sounds that sounds reasonable. So for right now, that's the best answer we have. So I'll put a little I'll put a little check mark next to it. It's the same because chromosomes are copied prior to meiosis. Hmm. That might be true, but that doesn't explain the combination. So I'm gonna mark through that. Different due to DNA replication prior to mitosis. It's D, different due to independent assortment during meiosis. Now, just from our first read, we've already eliminated one answer. We could eliminate num uh, letter A because it says the same. If there's one thing that we've learned from meiosis is that we're looking for genetic diversity genetic variation so we don't it's not going to be the same we don't want the same so again i can mark out a because it talks about same now just like that i have given myself a 50 50 shot to get this answer right my two choices left is c is different due to dna replication prior to mitosis and d different due to independent assortment during meiosis now Let's say I don't know what independent assortment is. And that's okay because I have the next slide that's going to talk about that. But let's say, hmm, I don't know what that means. But <clears throat> I do know mitosis and meiosis. I know that mitosis deals with somatic cells. And I know meiosis deals with gametes. The question is asking or the question mentions gametes twice, which would lead me to believe based off of my knowledge and my knowledge only of mitosis and meiosis that D would be the correct answer because mitosis has nothing to do with gametes. <coughs> no, excuse me. Everybody get that. Hopefully you did. Hopefully you'd already answered that. All right. As promised, I told you we had a slide on independent assortment. It's not a topic that we covered a lot on, but we covered just enough. But just know independent assortment is the random assorting into gametes. So you get crossing over after crossing over and we go through meiosis two again and we get those four different gametes and here is based off of these traits here here's what each, each gamete could possibly have these traits that is independent assortment it's random assorting into gametes that's as about as much information as you need to know so when you see that terminology independent assortment is in the phase of uh, meiosis, it's after crossing over. Ooh, here's a fun one. So we know this question is saying facial dimples and free air lobes are both considered dominant traits. I'm going to underline that. Dominant human traits. So what are the expected phenotypes of an offspring of a of the offspring of a female with dimples and free lobe free earlobes and a male with no dimples and attached earlobes. So first thing is the phenotype. Is that the code, the letters, or is that the actual like what we can see, the physical appearance? If you said what you can see, that is correct. So based off of this genotype what are we going to actually see with our own two eyes now what i've done for you is because 
this is already we've identified we're looking at two different traits right so what type of punnett square are we going to make ah that's right a die hybrid cross die hybrid punnett square that is what we're going to make today it's going to be a die hybrid punnett square <clears throat> so the first thing we look at is that we realize that in order for us to have at least one of each dominant trait, I know I have to have a big D for dimples and a big F for free air lobes. So let us go to the next slide where I have put together. Let's see if I can move this out of the way. All right, so <clears throat> what I've done for you is I've already created a Punnett square for you. So I've done the dihybrid Punnett square for you. We've already went over that. So remember, anytime that we do a dihybrid cross, we want to make sure that we go through our FOIL process to get our gametes. And as you can see, the gametes are here. So... <clears throat> What I've done is I've listed out my genotypes here, my codes. So I have eight boxes that are big D, little d, big F, little f, and we count them out. We go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All right? And then we also have big d little f or big d little d little f little f i have one two three four one two three four so my genotypes i have eight out of 16 that are this eight out of 16 that are big d little d little f little f now if you don't remember how we got that <clears throat> the way we did it was everything here comes across into every box and you do the same for these four and then this is going to come down into every box and that's how you do your crosses for each column in each row and remember dominant letter always comes first when we do a dihybrid cross we keep the same letters together so the D's stay with the D's, the F's stay with the F's. Now, based off of my genotypes, I get what I can actually see. So I am actually going to see, I have a possibility of seeing 50% of having offspring that are going to have dimples with free, earlo free earlobes. And then I have a 50% chance of seeing offspring that has dimples with attached earlobes. So... Remember, and I put this here as a reference because if I have at least one big D and one big F, then I know I'm going to have the dominant trait. Same thing here. So let's clear this off. Hopefully that made some sense for you. If not, pause this video, look at the dihybrid cross, make sure I'm right. But let's clear this off. Let's go back and look at our answer choices. If I can, there we go. So now, Based on the work that we've done, we look at our answer choices, and the correct choice would be F because we get we have a 50% chance of seeing dimples and free earlobes, and then 50% with dimples and attached earlobes. So, this is a little quick, easy tip on how you would solve that type of problem. Uh, lucky for you on your on your your test coming up on Friday. You don't have to create a die hybrid. Well, maybe you do. <laughs> but that is the process um, on how to do die hybrid. It won't be this elaborate. It will be something very quick. Uh, but again, you need to know if you see two traits, die hybrid, if we're only talking about one trait, like hair color, eye color, um, then yes, it's going to be a mono hybrid. So first thing is identifying how many traits are going to be looked at 
Uh, we're quickly approaching our last one. We've done that. Okay. This is our last question. So I'll say this the best for last, right? The question says, chickens can have different types of feathers. Frizzled feathers curl towards a chicken's head. Assume that feather type is determined by a single gene. So I'm going to underline that. We're talking about one gene. So we're going to go monohybrid cross. <clears throat> it's determined by a single gene, and that allele for frizzled feathers is dominant over the allele for straight feathers. So I'm going to put F here. I'm going to pick my alleles, my letter. It's going to be big F for frizzled. And little f for straight. So we got that figured out, right? So now I got big F for frizzled, little f for straight. Those are the alleles. Now, <clears throat> in a cross between two chickens, with straight feathers, what percentage of their offspring can be expected to have frizzled feathers? So the first thing we do, again, before I start looking at answer choices, because you may see this and go, I don't, I don't know. Why are you asking me this? I'm asking you this because you know how to do this. We just got to put, put a little work in. So we know that the two chickens have straight feathers. So we know that frizzled is dominant over straight. So we know straight genotype is going to be little f, little f, right? So what we have is parents that are little f, little f times or crossing with little f, little f. Make my Punnett square here. Little f, little f, little f. Little f, and then let's go to my boxes, make my Punnett squares. Based off of my Punnett square, my cross, what I have is little f, little f in every box, which means that based off of that, the feathers would be straight, right? Because we have two recessive alleles or two lowercase letters. So the, all these offspring are going to be have straight feathers. The question is asking what percentage of the offspring can be expected to have frizzled. The correct answer is F. Zero. Zero, zero, zero. None of these offspring are going to have frizzled feathers. Everybody understand how we got that? Excellent. Again, hopefully this video uh, gives you a little bit of confidence um, in knowing the basic information. So when we get to a test, the test now is going to kind of challenge you to use that basic understanding of concepts and then apply it to some more, I don't even like saying challenging because we've done these type of questions before. Um, but now you just have to know, uh, take what you know, and then use it in a more challenging type of question. Um, remember, test is on Friday. If you have any questions, please email me. Um, this has been another great video. I hope to see you on Friday. I know I will see you on Friday and you'll be prepared and ready to go. As always, peace.